Let me take this opportunity this afternoon uh, on behalf of Bromfontein Society Wesley Guild to greet you all, my dear friends at home, Guilders, one heart, uh, one way. We thank God for this afternoon that we are having together. Today we have a C for consecration and we are doing a Bible study, a contextual Bible study that will be led by Reverend uh, Kuku this afternoon together with his panel of Gilders and the Gilders from Bramfandi and Wesley Guild Society. And therefore, friends, allow me now to invite you to the time of prayer. Come, let us pray. You have afforded us, God, an opportunity to gather in this place. In this time, Lord, we want to honor you. This time, Lord, we want to glorify you. This time, God, we want to lift you up above every other name. This time, Lord, we want to give you sitting Pagama, rise, O Lord. Be with us in this afternoon. We pray, Lord, for the leadership of the society. We pray, Lord, for Mfundisi Yukuku, who will be leading us, and the members of the Wesley Guild that will participate in this program, and every guild that will be listening. Lord, be with us. Amen. Amen. Without taking much of your time, um, I was asked by the chairperson uh, to open the, um, the service. This is Bramfandane Society was declared under second 901. And therefore I will hand over to the chairperson of the society, Sister Sina Soyeza. She will do they welcome and introduce the guest. Um, let me take this opportunity to greet the president of Central 901, Wesley Guild, Umfunis Ungombo, Umfunis Opagati Kwetu, who will lead our session today, Umfunis Ukuku, the Central Synod MCYU coordinator, Central Synod treasurer, Central Synod Vice, um, Vice President of Central 901 Wesley Guild, Unopalawe MCYU, Walapekaya, Executive of Bramfontein, Gilders of Bramfontein, Gilders of Central Circuit 901, Gilders who are with us today and the Gilders who are watching us today, and Naya Wonge Umdos Bukeleo Namsanje, Dianibuli Sanonke Henge Kamalga Isu Trestu Ngosi. Amen. Welcome to the Bramfontein Wesley Guild Contextual Bible Study. Today, we are going to be discussing the story of the rape of Dinah, as we are living through the peak of reported gender-based violence in South Africa. We have decided to do this Bible study so that we can learn from this story of Dinah. Rev Google will facilitate the Bible study, as I have mentioned. After he has done with his presentation, um, there will be questions to be answered. You are all allowed to ask any questions you have based on his presentation. Over to you, Mfundisu Kuku. Thank you to the superintendent of the circuit, Umfundi Sunombo, 
who also is a president of Wesley Guild in the circuit, 901, the guilders of E. Bram van Dijn, Wesley Guild, and all those who are watching us this afternoon and the team that I'm with, uh, the treasurer of the MCYU and all the people, uh, Central Synod treasures, there are a lot of people. I cannot finish the protocol. Chairperson, it is a humbling opportunity for me to be part of this conversation this afternoon to share my thoughts and also my views on the subject matter that you presented before us. Before we start, let me bring greetings from Central Synod Children and Youth Unit. Uh, the Synod is greeting you and wishing you blessings as the society, as you continue to shine and do the, the work of MCF Children and Youth Ministry in your circuit. Secondly, to extend condolences to the Methodist people in 901 on the loss of Ugoko Mamusbiya, we pray may God of love comfort you and give you strength during this time. And all those who have died during this week, your superintendent mentioned that your circuit has been engulfed by so many deaths. We are praying with you during this time. Utito Magani Nigamanda Anomeleze. And lastly, as we gather for this Bible study, we have heard from the news U Mama Utagata in Dobsonville, who has been murdered and raped. She happened to be one of our members in the Methodist Church in Broderport Circuit. It is not an easy and it's very difficult and painful for her family, loved ones, and all people, because you don't know when will this happen to someone else tomorrow. Let us continue to pray. Let us continue to fight and confront the sketch. This afternoon, I have been asked to come and converse with you in a contextual Bible study. I have been given a scripture rating, Genesis chapter 34, verse 1 to 34. I want to give a topic for our conversation this afternoon in whatever that we're going to do, in whatever that we're going to say, may we focus our minds in this topic. The topic for this afternoon, critical response to the implication of patriarchal violence and rape culture in our society. Critical response to the implications of rape culture and patriarchal violence in our society. We gather together this afternoon in a state of brokenness, devastation, disappointment, and anger, shame and fear because of what is happening around us. The distortion of human dignity of women and the brutality of gender-based violence that is happening in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our places of worship, in our workplaces, in our public spaces. The evil and the brutal behavior of gender-based violence, we are no longer struggling to see it or find it or experiencing it. It is in our doorsteps, in every corner, in every sphere, there is gender-based violence. Every hour, it is happening. And we can no longer keep quiet. We can no longer pretend and act as if it is not with us. So as the church, it is our duty to respond. It is our duty to act. It is our duty to engage. The founder of Methodism, John Wesley, says, there is no personal holiness, but social holiness. It means our holiness cannot end with us, but our holiness should be expressed in our actions. So as the church, we need to move beyond the four walls of our church buildings and be present and visible in the society because the church is not isolated from the society but the church is in the society. And so therefore, we cannot divorce the church from the society. We cannot divorce the church from the social, political factors that are facing 
the society because the society is made up by the people who are from the church and the church is made up by the people who are from the society. As we continue to converse about this topic of patriarchal violence and rape culture in our society, there's a word patriarchy, which I think will be one of the keywords we're going to explore this afternoon. Mercy Oduyeye, who is a Ghanaian feminist theologian, in her book, Daughters of Anoa, she writes, she says, patriarchal violence and rape culture knows no cultural, religious, political, and economic bounds, and it is found in every sphere of society. So she says, patriarchy knows no culture, knows no religion, knows no political sphere. It has no limitation. You cannot say, because I'm a white person, I'm excluded from patriarchy. Because I'm a black person, I'm excluded from patriarchy. Because I'm coming from a rich and wealthy family, I'm excluded from patriarchy. No, patriarchy knows no color, knows no bounds. And secondly, we live in a society that is male dominated. Although males are few, the voice of males, it's dominant. The power of male is dominant. Males wants to dominate wherever they are. I'm a daughter, afunu pata, afunu vagala, afunu bandongondongo, wherever they are. And they want to be felt that they are dominant. So male ego is dominant in our society. Although patriarchy, it's an ideology that men have power over women, men are superior over women. It's an ideology that says women are inferior to men. It's an ideology that says women are lesser human beings than men. But I want to say this afternoon, Patriarchy is no longer an ideology now, but patriarchy, it is a belief that men embody. I'm a daughter, they believe that they are superior than, men, than women. I'm a daughter, they believe women are lesser human beings. It has moved from being an ideology, but now it is a statement of belief that men embody and men live with in their lives until we confront that belief system that men have, until we engage critically with that belief so that we are able to dismantle that belief men have. The gender-based violence that we see happening in our society, the rape culture that we see happening in our society, it is informed and it finds basis from patriarchal ideologies and beliefs by men and society that has. Patriarchy, it is violent in its nature. Patriarchy, in its essence, it is violent. There is no way we can say there are elements of goodness in patriarchy. There are no elements of goodness. The moment one wants to be superior than another person, that on its own becomes an evil behavior that on its own becomes an evil um, attitude or practice. Because God created both male and female equally so to be like God. He did not create male to be superior than men and women to be inferior than men. We are created equally to be, to be like God. So this afternoon, we are going to converse and we are going to engage critically about patriarchal violence and also rape culture. And then contextual Bible study, it is a critical and engagement method of doing Bible study. It is unlike other forms of Bible study where I will only talk, but contextual Bible study, it is conversational. And contextual Bible study takes the scripture and allows the scripture to speak into our social, political, economic challenges and allow the scripture to bring answers into the questions that we are facing socially, politically, and culturally in our society. And so the aspect of our focus for this Bible study will be on rape culture and patriarchy. We'll focus on social aspects 
of our lives. Can I now ask, um, as we continue to do contextual Bible study, we use see, judge, act method when we do this. The method of contextual Bible study, it is people-centered rather than centered on the facilitator. It is more conversational dialogue rather than monologue. So we are going to converse. I'm going to introduce the test, text before us and also give the background and the context. And then we don't, we then engage and share our thoughts. Can I ask U Sister Musa to read for us Genesis chapter 24, verse 25 to 31? The scripture reads as follows. But three days later, when their wounds were still sore, two of Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, who were Dinah's four brothers, took their swords and entered the town without opposition. Then they slaughtered every male there, including Hamor and his son Shechem. They killed them with their swords, then took Dinah from Shechem's house and returned to their camp. Meanwhile, the rest of Jacob's sons arrived, finding the men slaughtered. They plundered the town because their sister had been defiled there. They seized all the flocks and herds and donkeys, everything they could lay their hands on, both inside the town and outside the, in the fields. They looted all their wealth and plundered their houses. They also took all their little children and wives and led them away as captives. Afterward, Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have ruined me. You've made me stink among all the people of this land, among all the Canaanites and the Perizzites. We are so few that they will join forces and crush us. I will be ruined and my entire household will be wiped out. But why should we let him treat our sister like a prostitute? They reported angrily. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you so much. As we continue to reflect, if you notice and you read carefully, most of the stories in the Old Testament and the New Testament in the Bible were told by men. And also, men were central in those stories. Women in these stories are insignificant and invisible, and their voices is not that heard. It's not that louder. Their voices, their ideologies and ideas are suppressed. In the world, in the ancient world of Israel, males dominated the religious, political, cultural, and judicial life. So in every sphere of society, there was male domination. In every sphere in the ancient Israel, men dominated, men took lead, men were in the center stage, and women were not having a key role to play or fulfill. And not because that they were unable to, to fulfill any role, not because that they were unable to express themselves or do anything. They had all abilities, but patriarchal society suppressed women in the ancient Israel society. Many women played important roles in the cultural, social, and religious life of ancient Israel, but their stories are not told in full. If their stories are told, they are told in the context of men. For those women who, who played critical role in the life of ancient Israel, their stories are not told in full. If they are told, the, the men will be in the context around, men will be aligned or attached to that conversation so that the story of that woman can only be seen to be visible when there's a man behind that woman. Many prominent women in ancient Israel remain unnamed and unrecognized for their contributions they made in their society. And in general, their stories appeared in the Bible were not told in full. So as we continue to explore this passage, there are key words and also that we are going to use for this Bible study. As we start, I want us 
to unpack those few words which will, sum, will summarize the essence of our contextual Bible study. The first word, it is patriarchy. Patriarchy, it is defined as the social system that promotes male domination. It is a system that promotes subordination of women and subjection of women to male hierarchy. The word patriarchy primarily is understood as male power over women. The second word that we're going to get in this contextual Bible study or talk about, it is culture. We are going to explore and hear more of the word culture. John Beatty defines culture as the way our society is organized and it includes the values, the customs, practices, and attitudes that a particular group of people holds in the society, including their beliefs and their practices. And John Beatty says culture can be, can be a sign of positivity or a sign of negativity. Culture can be constructive, culture can be disruptive, culture can be life-giving, culture can be harmful. In the context of this Bible study, culture was very harmful, culture was very disruptive, culture was holding life, was holding women to express their lives into fullness. And the third word that we're going to get in this contextual Bible study it is rape culture. The word rape culture is a term used to describe the social cultural normalization of sexual violence. It is a term that is used to normalize or institutionalize the sexual violence. It is a term that is used to say sexual violence, it is an acceptable behavior or practice in the society. And that is rape culture. And then also in this passage, we are going to encounter the word custodians of rape culture and patriarchal violence. Custodians of rape culture and patriarchal violence. These are systems and individuals in the society, in every sphere of the society individuals and systems that oversees and advocates, promote and protect the very systems of rape culture and sexual violence. Those systems that we have in the society, those individuals that we have in the society, although they don't directly sexually violate women, although they don't directly oppress women, but indirectly, they are their actions, their ideologies, they contribute to sexual violence, they contribute to rape culture. And such systems and individuals are referred to custodians of rape culture. And then the fifth word that we are going to explore in this contextual Bible study, it is male privilege. Male privilege, it is a system or advantages or rights that are available to men solely based on their sex. Male privilege, it is a privilege or rights that is given or that is available for men just because they are, the, 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 just because of their gender. And then the last word that we're going to explore in this contextual Bible study, it is forced marriage or arranged marriages. In our modern context, we call it ukutwala. Forced marriage, it is a marriage in which one or more parties are married without the consent of their will. Forced or arranged marriage is ukutwala. It is when a, a woman enters into a marriage without her consent or will. That can be that can be culturally practiced, that can be religiously practiced, that can be socially practiced. The moment there's no will, the moment there's no consent or permission given by the woman to say, I voluntarily want to enter into this union, 
then that is forced marriage or arranged marriage. As I've mentioned earlier, that the Bible has full of stories of rape culture and patriarchal violence. If you look at the story of the rape of Tamar, which happened in the palace by her own brother, Amnon, it is one of the brutal stories of rape culture. Also, if you read also the story of a Levite concubine who was gang raped by men the whole night at Gibeah, she was handed over to these strangers by the host who was hosting them for a night in protection of, of the men. She exchanged to give the Levite concubine instead of protecting the powerless, vulnerable woman, but he handed over to be raped. And there are many stories in the Bible about um, rape culture and patriarchal violence. From the passage we have read this afternoon, Genesis chapter 34, verse one to 34, we encounter the story of the brutal rape of Dinah. She was raped by a man. Her rape was supported and advocated and protected by other men. All what was done, it was done against the will and consent of Dinah in this passage. In throughout the scenario of her rape, her voice is suppressed. Her voice is silent. We hear nothing about her. We hear nothing about her emotions. We hear nothing about her ideologies. We hear nothing about her expressions. Her voice, we don't hear it because for those who are telling the story, Dinah's side of the story was insignificant and meaningless and useless unto them. It is something that is happening even in today's context. The voice of the victims in rape, so in rape, in, in rape incidents is always suppressed. Their emotions, their side of the story is always insignificant and meaningless. Ebesia pepsuku, ebenyo why was she revealing her body? Why was she walking alone? A question is not asked why the sexual lust ideology in that man, why that man had sexual lust ideologies, but the voice and the emotions of the victims in, in rape culture is always suppressed and insignificant and meaningless. We are introduced to Diana who was Jacob's only daughter. She was supposed to be the pride of Jacob. It should be her pride. It should be her joy. It should be something that she's proud and also willing to fight and protect and take care of because it's her only daughter. She was not only the daughter of Leah and Jacob, but she was a granddaughter of Isaac and Rebecca. And, and Dinah, because when she was raped, she was very young. She was in her late teens. That should be around 15 years or 14 years, if I'm not mistaken. When, when, when we read from verse one of this passage in chapter 34, it says, Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, went to see the daughters of the land. It might be Dinah because she was the only daughter growing up with 11 boys in the house, with 11 brothers. She was lonely. There was a void in her. She was looking for a company, an association of women in her age or in her live in her area. Udaina, when she left her home, her place of safety, her place of refuge, she never imagined or thought of being raped on her way to look for company and fellowship. The Bible doesn't say whether she was wearing a miniskirt. The Bible doesn't say 
whether she was revealing her body. The Bible only says she was walking alone, looking for the daughters of the land. And that on its own, we should draw similarities that women are raped whether they reveal their bodies or not revealing their bodies. Women are always taken advantage of because they are perceived to be powerless, vulnerable, and weak. The problem of rape culture, it is not about women. It is not women, how they behave in the society. But the problem of rape culture, it is all about men with their sexual lustful desires. That is the problem of rape culture. The problem of rape culture, it is not about the behavior of women in the society. It is not about the femininity of women in the society. It, is, it, ha it has all to do with the sexual lustful desires of men in the society. It, is, it has all to do with their sense of entitlement in the society. As men, we think that we are entitled to sleep with any woman whom we wish to sleep with in the society, whether they give consent or will to that. It is something that is engraved in us as men that we've got a sense of entitlement. But even if that will bring pain, humiliation, and harm to her. There's a problem of sense of entitlement in us as men. Secondly, the problem of rape culture, it's a problem of male privilege. Our masculinity that we have, the power that we have, the physical power that we have, instead of using it to protect women, instead of using it to fight other men, we are using it to overcome women. We are taking advantage of women because they, we think they are physically weak and powerless. So our male privilege, it is the second problem that we have as men. Secondly, in verse two of this chapter says, Shechem, the son of Homer, a Hivite priest, prince, a Hivite prince of the country, saw Dinah. He took her, he lay with her, and violated her. Now, I want you to notice this. Ushakem saw Dinah. Ushakem used his male privilege to violate and exploit Udaina. Ushakem used his male privilege, used his male power, used his social standing in the society that he is a prince, he is a son, he is a prince, he has a right of getting whatever that he wants in the society. He uses his male power, he uses his male dominance, he uses his male privilege to, to exploit a young, innocent, powerless woman. And then, all that happened between Dinah and, and Shechem, we are not told if Dinah gave consent or gave permission to Shechem to do that. Then that tells you it is not alleged rape. That is rape. One of the key contributing factors to rape culture in our society in the ancient Israel and even in the modern society, the language contributes so much. Language that we use, alleged rape, alleged rapist. The moment you penetrate without her will and consent, it's no longer alleged, it is rape. And then, Rape culture in, in the ancient Israel was institutionalized and systematic. Laws of ancient Israel, imitated of Israel, advocated and promoted rape culture. Promoted and also imitated of ancient Israel, 
did not protect the victim. Instead, imitator of the ancient Israel protected and advocated for the perpetrator. Can I invite you to read with me Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 28 and 29, where you will see rape culture being institutionalized and, and being systematic in Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 28 to 29 says, we hear if a man happens to meet a virgin girl who is not pledged to be married and rapes her and they are discovered, he shall pay her father 50 shekels of silver. He must marry those young women for he violated her. He cannot divorce her as long as they live. This law justified sexual violence. This law justified sexual assault. This law justified rape culture. So rape in the ancient Israel was something that was an acceptable practice, was something that was, was advocated. Rape of young, innocent, and powerless woman it was an acceptable practice. It was an acceptable behavior in the society because the laws of the land advocated and promoted and protected it. Let me say this this afternoon. Law cannot be equivalent to justice. Law cannot be equivalent to justice. Why do I say law cannot be equivalent to justice? The fact that we have laws in our land, those land cannot be equivalent to justice, cannot be equated to justice. Because laws of the land are man-made, and laws of the land are influenced by social, political, cultural, and economic factors of that particular context of that, at that particular time. Therefore, we cannot say law, it is just. Let me bring it back closer to home. In South Africa in 1948, apartheid was introduced as the law, which justified racial discrimination those laws sought to advance white privilege and protect white privilege in our society. Although apartheid was legislated as a law, but it was never a just system. Therefore, even the laws of ancient Israel, they were never just because the laws of ancient Israel were made by men the laws of ancient Israel were made to advance and protect the rape culture and the patriarchal violence in the ancient Israel. The laws in the ancient Israel, because they were main made, those who were making the laws in the ancient Israel were custodians of rape culture. Ngabantu bebe kusela, the rape culture and sexual violence that was happening in the ancient Israel. Even now in our modern society, our laws, most of the times, they favor perpetrators instead of the victim. If you listen and you follow some stories of rape in the courts of law, I watched and my heart was so painful when a white privilege prevailed in a case of a rape. A young girl is raped at Dross restaurant. When this young girl is raped, a male privilege, a white privilege prevailed in that instance. The first thing that we are told, that young white man must be taken for psychiatric evaluation. 
when everyone was there, when he saw that he raped a young girl, but because of the male privilege and the white privilege that we have in our society today, he must be taken for psychiatric evaluation. I followed another case of uh, Tim Otoso, or Motoso in PE. When the victims are interrogated, I saw how these young women were dehumanized, how these young women, their human dignity was stripped off instead of being embraced, instead of being assisted to experience justice, justice system dehumanized them, stripped off their human dignity. The rules of a helper of the Methodist Church by John Wesley says, the judge is always on the side of the prisoner. And that indeed, it is evident in our society. Law cannot be equated to justice. The laws of the land in ancient Israel, they saw women as mere objects and properties of men. Women in ancient Israel were viewed as properties of their fathers, husbands, when they get married. When they are widowed, they become properties of their own sons. When they are slaves, they had no liberty of being freed during the time of freeing of the slaves. Although a male slave during the year of Jubilee could be freed, but female slaves could not be freed because women were viewed as just properties and objects. At the heart of rape culture, at the heart of sexual violence, it is us men wanting to prove a point that we have power over women. At the heart of rape culture and sexual violence, it is us men wanting to prove a point that we are dominating or we are, we are having an upper hand over women. In the ancient Israel, women were always at the receiving end. They were not at the giving end, the giving point. When Shechem finished raping Dinah, he went to his father and he told his father he wants to marry this girl. Listen to that on its own, that statement. The scripture says, I want to marry this girl. She's no longer having a name. She's no longer having an identity. She's just a mere girl that I want to marry after I have violated her. This is the kind of a society. Women are dehumanized. Women are belittled. Women are dehumanized. They even lose their identity. La way when we address them. La Medi, when we address them. La Mdwana, when we address them. When we see women, we see objects. When we see women, we see properties. And then the scripture doesn't say whether Jacob, the father of Shechem, scolded, confronted Shechem for his actions and behavior. But the scripture says his father arranged to meet with Homer, the father of Shechem. Sorry, the father of, of Dinah. So the father of Dinah, when he gets to meet with the father of Shechem, he doesn't protect her daughter. He's not fighting for her daughter. All that he did was to protect and advance rape culture. What was more interesting, it is the emotions. It was not the emotions of her daughter. How her daughter felt, how her daughter viewed all the scenario and the situation, it had nothing to do, it matters not to him. All that matters was to protect and advance the interests of the society, of the rape culture. The mindset of Jacob and Homer makes me to say they, be, they are custodians of rape culture 
and patriarchal violence. Although Jacob and Homer did not directly, were not directly involved in the rape of Dinah, but their mindset makes me to say, we cannot divorce the actions of Shechem to their actions. We cannot divorce their mindset to the actions of Dinah. And then, allow me to say, the custodians of rape culture in our society, they are guilty like the perpetrators of rape in our society. The punishment given to those who are rapists, it is a punishment that also must be given to those who protect rapists and advance rape culture in our society. When you talk about custodians of rape culture in today's context, it is our parents. When I have raped or violated a girl, my parents will go and pay Postnetemba and say, Sizosha Ulichala, Sizosha Ula Inyala, Sizot Inyala. Let us not talk about this because we're going to shame that family. Those who are suppressing, those who are protecting the shame and the brutality of rape are custodians of rape culture. And those people are guilty. They are not innocent. They are guilty like the rapists themselves. Interestingly, in the scripture, the brothers of Dinah, when they came back from the fields, they discovered these news. They become angry of this violation and they want to fight and bring vengeance and justice for their sister. And they want to protect their sister. In ancient Israel and in the modern society, men who protect women and support women are perceived to be powerless and less masculine. Go see, single Andana, I'm a daughter who protects women in our modern society. I'm a daughter who, who fights for justice in our modern society, are perceived and are given names, Go Andana, are given names, Go CC, are given names to be weak and powerless. Throughout the story, Dinah was silent. Her mother was silent. The mother of Shechem was silent. Women in the village were silent. We don't hear of their stories. We don't hear of their voice. We don't hear nothing about them. I am not sure whether because rape culture and patriarchal violence, stories of women are insignificant and meaningless, or it's because they too were custodians of rape culture. Because custodians of rape culture, it is not only men, also women, they themselves sometimes, they become custodians of rape culture. When I was watching the video of Pretoria Central, when a young girl, I don't know the concluding story, but when I saw a young girl standing in front lamenting, protesting just for justice, it was women who jumped first to remove her in that place. Because society has instilled value systems and beliefs to, to the women to say, you too, you need to protect men because men are the heads of the house. And in conclusion of the story, the brothers of Dinah, Simeon and Levi, continue to seek justice for their sister. They ended up killing Shechem and his father and every male in the town. They rape all women in pillage in the city. I think the punishment they gave to Shechem was too much. Even the innocent now had to suffer. But all I can say, the brothers of Dinah, they could not be silenced in the face of rape culture and sexual violence. They could not be silenced in the face of brutality of their sister. And then later, Jacob, in verse 
in, in chapter 49, sharply condemned the violent actions of Simeon and Levi. Even when, when, when Jacob had a chance to dismantle rape culture in his own village or family, but he advocated and promoted for it. Then in conclusion, as I open for conversation, rape culture and patriarchal violence, it's not something new. It is something that is old. Throughout the scripture, the tradition and experience, we have seen it. It has been institutionalized and systematized. But allow me to say this afternoon, it can never be acceptable practice in our society. We need to break that cycle. Secondly, as I conclude, charity begins at home. If we want to break the cycle of rape culture and patriarchal violence in our society, we need alternative ways of parenting where crucial conversations become core and crucial for our parenting. As parents, when we raise our children, we need to talk about implications of patriarchal violence and sexual assault in our communities. We need to engage our children, especially about how to confront it. Another thing as we now want to have alternative ways of parenting, something that I think it is very crucial and key, we need to dismantle gender roles, especially those gender roles that seeks and advocates for women to be seen as lesser human beings than men. The, the gender roles where the place of a young girl is, is in the kitchen to cook, to wash dishes, and the place of a young boy is in the garden and in the outside yard, and the, and the gender roles where women, you are a weak, you are a flower, soft, and all that, all those gender roles, we need to dismantle them as we now find alternative ways of parenting. Because those gender roles plays a critical role in the upbringing of the children that we have. The society that we have today, it is a society that is shaped and influenced by the upbringing that we received in our homes, the upbringing that we received in our churches, in our schools. How we were shaped and influenced in our upbringing plays a critical role to a kind of a society that we have today. So in, uh, in parenting now, we need to dismantle gender roles. Tell her you are stronger. Tell her you need to say no when something you don't agree with. Tell her if you are against, it is against your will and concern, don't subject yourself to that. By so doing, we are creating a society that will confront the patriarchal violence. And then lastly, as we continue to dismantle and fight this, we need to do a theology, a feminist theology and women's theology needs to be part of our late trainings. In our confirmation classes, in our Bible studies, in our class meetings, in our organizations, we need to find ways of doing these contextual Bible studies that will seek to empower that will seek to confront patriarchal violence, that will seek to confront um, uh, also rape culture. These contextual Bible studies should not only be done when we do campaigns, but they should be ongoing services that we have as our lay training in our churches. And lastly, our education system, it needs to be decolonized in our country. Implications of patriarchal violence and rape culture should be mandatory subjects of thought in our schools. We need in our schools to, to teach a different culture that will instill values that a culture that will say every person should be respected. People are equal. People deserve human dignity. 
we need to encourage women to reclaim their rightful position in the legal fraternity in our country. If we are intentional about changing the laws of our land so that the laws of our land cannot advocate and not have the preferential treatment for the perpetrators of rape culture, we need more women in our legal fraternity so that the voice of women can be heard when the laws of the land are drafted and when the laws of the land are executed, women to take lead in ensuring that justice is happening in our society. I will now invite um, the chairperson to lead us into questions, a conversation that we're going to have now. We have questions that are based on this, on this passage, which will lead and guide our conversation. Chairperson. Thank you, Mfundisu. Um, checking the questions. Um, the first question is, who are the characters in the story and the role of each character in the story? That's the first question. Must I read all the questions? No, let's allow people to respond to the first question and then we move to the second question. It's okay. an open conversation we can engage now. Just to jump in, okay. here, uh, coordinator, um, and greetings, everyone. Uh, the, the, what I just wanted to emphasize on uh, uh, Bejula, over and above what you, you had spoken about, um, <clears throat> so with the characters. Um, I, I was particularly interested in the role of the men um, in this uh, passage. <clears throat> the men who are part of the village um, of Hamo. Um, so, and I'll, I'll, I'll make a couple of uh, assumptions. And the first being, you know, when the rape happened, it, it happened in their village. And um, this would have happened in their presence. And so at no point did these men um, seek to stop it or seek to um, condemn what happened or even reprimand one of their own. And they were even willing to help in the cover up of the rape to, to the extent that um, they, they agreed to even change their culture. Um, in terms of their culture, they did not, or they were not required to be um, <clears throat> circumcised. But part of the uh, cover up entailed them being circumcised so that this arranged marriage could happen. So I, I see men who go to serious lengths to protect each other and to not want to call each other out and want to reprimand each other. And this is something that is persistent even um, in today's age, that men get away with a lot and where a brother has not done well, we 
most of the time seek to ignore that. And, and so that was one thing which I found very problematic with these uh, characters in particular. You know, the men of the village, they witness a rape, they, they say nothing about it. Um, but instead, they are willing to go and, and cover up a very, um, you know, devious act. And ultimately, what happened, they lost their lives, you know, so it was really not worth it. It was really, really not worth it. Um, and so this seems to say, you know, unless men come together and seek to protect um, uh, society in general, but most importantly, call out each other, you know, men ultimately will um, lead to their own destruction um, because the actions of these various men will come back to, you know, haunt um, men as a whole. And, and this is, you know, just the point I wanted to highlight on the characters, just the role of these men who were part and parcel of the rape, but, um, you know, went to serious lengths to try and uh, protect one of their own, um, essentially. It is, um, yeah, ultimately something that was despicable and something that we should not accept, um, you know, as men in our times, um, something that we need to actively uh, work on to reprimand each other where um, uh, we have done wrong and to admit and to seek to correct our actions but not merely play um, the role of you know um, uh, covering each other yeah thanks that is the point I had wanted to make um, coordinator um, hello Reverend Pezil Yes. Um, just to add on to um, the focus on men in the story, as U Brother Lebhang was focusing on that, um, as I was reading, I saw two types of men. There are men that want to protect women, and then there are men that want to protect another man. Um, so Shechem and his father and Jacob, I feel like, wanted to protect Shechem. And then Simeon and Levi acted on behalf of their sister. Now, upon acting, then the rest of the brothers came to, to act with them. Now, even in today's society, we find men like that. Men who sit back and don't say a thing, but as soon as oh, Brother Lebuchan does something about rape culture, then they act as though they, they, they are part of those that are fighting for women. Um, so that is a comparison that I saw between the well, in terms of the men in the story. Thank you. Um, I think for me, I just want to focus on the characters being um, being the parents of the, the rape victim, Utaina. Um, we see here Jacob, who when first being informed of this rape of his daughter, and decided to be silent about it and wait for his son to <clears> come <throat> back so that he may make a decision. And this culture, I'm very glad that um, you have already explained the, 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 what culture is. Um, because culture is very, it's defined by society. And when we, when we go back to the, the 1820s or the 1800s during the time of Shagazul, we, we, we saw this rape culture, which then became something that happened in the society where um, a man would take a woman, or especially a virgin woman, and lay with her and then inform the parents after. And this now became something that was adopted <clears throat> by the Zulu culture, which um, went on to happen and happen until we get to what is happening today. And parents, 
who was the wife of Ushaka Zulu after Ushaka Zulu raped Unandi. They were silent because Ushaka Zulu was a king. And we see that also in this passage where Ushakem is of a, high, a family of status. And that might be one of the reasons why Jacob felt that he should be quiet about this rape because it was committed by someone of a high statute in the society. And till today, we still, have, we see, we still see it happening, just like you had said um, in your presentation that people with high statute in the society are given less of a punishment or because someone might be gaining something from what had transpired. And you had mentioned that when we leave our place of safety, that being our homes, our homes no longer become a place of safety <clears throat> after the rape was committed. Because clearly in this instance, Udaina might have left home as a place of safety, but it was no longer a place of safety if her parents could not protect her. So <clears throat> what are our parents doing to protect us? When you come home raped, what are our parents saying to us? Are you asking a question, what happened? Or are you acting to protect your children? That's my two cents. Um, um, my first thoughts, that... sorry, um, I hear that everyone has mentioned um, the male presence in the scripture, right? I um, mean, you know, when I read the Bible, well, according to the book that I read, right, the, the, the topic of the scripture says Dinah and the Shechemites. And from what I discovered in here is that Udaina was put as part of the topic, but then she was excluded at the end. Um, for example, she is part of the theme, she is part of the story, but along the way, she is dismissed, she is removed from all the thought processes and all the decision making that is done throughout the entire scripture. Um, I, I, I choose to, 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 to put my mind on this character, Dinah, because I feel like she is like most women in our society who are put on a pedestal, but only put there to, uh, to make the numbers, put there to create a story. But when it comes to listening to the woman in the, in the story or in the, in the society, there's no one who is there to listen to them. Um, for instance, we sit in boardrooms where we look at the whole 40, 60, 60, 20, 80, 20 ratios, but every single time a woman's name is put up front, there's no one to back it up. There's no one to listen to the woman. So my first disturbance in this entire scripture was that when you introduce the story or when you introduce the, 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 the actual chapter, you say Dinah and the Shechemites, but throughout the entire process, the, 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 the presence of the woman, including Dinah's mother, is absent. Um, we hear of Dinah in the beginning of the incident, and then throughout and at the end, we only hear the voices of the men, which shows that patriarchy was involved in the writing of this chapter already. It just shows you how much of, of, of domination of the old dominance that men have, even in the writing of the chapters in the Bible. For example, if you look at how men objectified us, I say us because I'm a woman, but I say how they objectified women in, in, in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 21 and in the book of Judges, the rules that were put together to define how men should treat women who are defiled by men, do not justify or give justice to women. Instead, they treat women as objects that don't have any significance. And they tell that they tell a, a society to uh, uh, marry the woman in order to remove as as so that the dignity of the man can remain stained. The problem with that is that no one speaks about the actual act that the man does to the woman. The focus is always on the woman. And when the focus is on the woman, it's not one of a positive manner. It's always one of dirtiness, of, of neglect, or of negativity. But every single time 
a man does something wrong, we brush it under the carpet. So for me, the, the biggest character in this is Diana. But unfortunately, Diana as the theme and as the topic that we're discussing today has been suppressed because once again, patriarchy has decided to go on top of what the victim is going through. So I think for me, the first character that I look at when I read this chapter is Dinah, only because we speak of her, but we dismiss her at the same time. And then we focus on all the other men who were making the decisions, who were also the same men who, for example, Uliva and, and the brother, they, they, they want justice, but they, they promote justice through violence. How, how do you a, a, a turn out fire with fire? How do you say I am a, a, a fixing a problem by doing the same problem where you take other women and treat them as your slaves and you take them into marriage without their consent? There is no justification if your justification does the same thing that the paper taker does. I feel that Diana has been minimized even though she is part of the bigger picture in this uh, a, a chapter. The same way we are minimizing churches, you will get a woman who is voted for into presidency, but the level of respect will never be the same as the man. And that's where patriarchy always comes on top, which goes back down to your topic, Mfundisi, that you said promotion of male domination, how men will always be a lower number in terms of quantity, but the term, in terms of quality, society seems to respect men more than women the same way in this chapter where we speak of diana but at the end of the day we're focusing again on the men who did the the, the violence onto her so for me my, my biggest disturbance in this entire chat is how we 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 put her on top when we when we start and say diana and the shakamites but afterwards when we go down you even forget that she's there so that's my biggest that's the first character that that comes to mind when i read throughout this uh, topic Thanks, Sister Ntabiseng. Uh, I wanted also to add on that uh, before you speak, uh, that um, to me as well, Taina was more violated. Taina was violated by his father for being silent after this has, had happened to her. Uh, instead of this rapist going to apologize to the victim, the rapist went to the father. And now the father doesn't have the feelings. The father doesn't have the father didn't account uh, into looking into her daughter, Uguti. How is she feeling at this current moment? That's what saddens me. Uguti, we as the parents, we are the perpetrators as well, because the father should have said, okay, let me call my daughter. How did you do this to my daughter, to my very own daughter, my only daughter? So that's where Sister Ntabi saying, I think also my, 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 my main focus here was on Taina because Utaina was put a solo tape in her mouth. She couldn't speak for herself. She couldn't raise uh, the points. What happened? How does she feel? Instead, they are they are busy arranging a marriage, getting married to someone who who you don't love and who has violated you. That's something else, and it's happening in our community. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to the chairperson for the question and to if facilitator to for the introduction. Can I then attempt to simply answer the question, who are the characters in this passage that we read and you so eloquently introduced to us? I, I also want to say in me following your reading this afternoon, I picked up that yes, in this passage that we're going through these characters were identified and named back then in that Old Testament reading. But in society today, as we stand these characters, we can also um, name them. We have these characters, although in our society, in our context right now and today, we can't actually put their names. For instance, the, the, the young lady who was violated is Uutaina uh, in that passage. But if you look at society today, she represents a number of young, vulnerable young women who are violate, violated every day. And as you read throughout the passage, she becomes voiceless. So that, that's, that's, that's one reputation that she has. She represents a number of Voiceless, voiceless young people who are in society today. You look at the character of the perpetrator who is J uh, Shechem in the story. Shechem in the story is a, represents in our modern society now a figure of privilege, a male figure who comes from the royal family, who then identifies something that 
he 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 wants or he, he lasts for. And so easily he goes to grab it and then approaches the father and says to the father, but I want that. There is a lot of perpetrators who are like that in society today that we can name as 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 as, as the shakens. And over and above that, we have people like your your J Ham Jacob's uh, father, who then says, instead of us trying to correct this and going and apologizing there, let me use also my privilege of being a prince or of, be of becoming a king in the palace and approach this family, not to apologize, not to say my son has done wrong, let's look at ways of punishing him, but rather let's look at ways of how am I going to seal or settle the shame that was brought upon my son on this family. You look at the character of, 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 of Jacob, the father of the victim, who now is willing to sit down and negotiate a way of settling the shame that was brought upon uh, his family by a perpetrator. He does not look at what are the means of trying to sort out and getting justice done for my daughter, but instead, let us look at, at ways of let's sit and settle this. But the last one that I, I, I the second two last ones that I am really troubled by were the sons of Jacob who took it upon themselves that they could not sit and be silent while injustice was being carried out. There is a number of those people, there is a number of those characters in our society today that cannot stand and see injustices carried out on other people. You see people getting uh, beaten up or by the community because they've done such instances as the ones that was created or done by Shechem. So uh, those brothers represent a number of people that are, or a number of characters that are there in society today. Um, but the most important one was, um, I think you alluded to it earlier, um, facilitator, that the mothers of the two main characters, if I may put it like that, the mothers of Dinah as well as the mother of Shechem, they, 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 I want to say there are also characters in this passage, although nothing is said about them, they're silent characters. Um, in a way, they represent the silence of, of society. Um, a number of these cases where people are bitten, raped, and, 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 and murdered in, our, in the societies that we live in. Society, most of the time, becomes silent and quiet. Is it because that we now, live, or, or, or I would say the female patriarchies, they leave it, matriarchies, they leave it up to the male roles to now let them be the ones that sort out these issues. Let us not get involved in how society and how culture does these things. Is that not what society is supposed to be doing is if something is done wrong, society needs to come out and they need to have conversations in terms of now, how do we sort ways in identifying um, uh, measures of putting into place that this thing doesn't happen going forward. So those are the basically the six characters that I'm picking up from the passage. And I've also identified who they would be in our current society today. Thank you. Thank you, Budi. Um, I have another question. The question is from the scripture, draw similar similarities of ancient and modern culture of patriarchal violence and rape culture. Rape, forced marriage, peace offering to seal and settle rape culture. Um, one heart, I was waiting for the person to note my hand, but I think she's preoccupied um, with other things while she's facilitating. I think there are a lot of us um, that she has to pay attention to. So to answer your question, I'd, I think rape culture today and patriarchal violence is pretty much the same as in the olden days. And I'm saying this because on top of suffering the injustice of rape, Dinah was also forced to marry the perpetrator as a means to conceal um, the ordeal or to do right by her. Because I believe 
in Shechem's mind, or rather in Shechem's male privileged mind, he thought that Uku Uku Chada Utaina would would make do right by her, would would bring back his dimasake in society because I think he believed and also he knew in Dogba by him violating her, he was taking something away from her. So it is the layake of trying to make her whole, which also is is a, an outcome of male privilege. I think that's how men think that if I rape her and marry her, I'm making her whole again. And this is pretty much the same thing we see in society today, where the family of the perpetrator would come to the family of the victim with an envelope, any money, and say they are bringing a peace offering so that kutritwe ikyal. If you are a person who kulele lalin, you will know this, that kuzo yuakom kulwe, kuzo kopa konelo jala. And the victim is not even there. Sometimes even the perpetrator is excluded from that conversation or that justice system kind of thing where they seek to, to, to find a way to make right by the victim. Thank you. I think um, rape culture could be something that is taught because I believe that sometimes our society values, norms, beliefs and practices are not something that, some things that we are born with, but there's something that we are taught through um, our families, our cultures, our traditions and our families. And I believe is that a lot of times I think tradition that is passed on from generation to generation just gets passed down without the acknowledgement or the, 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 the sifting of the dangers or the, 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 the negativities that it brings down to the, the next generations. For instance, if I had to get married to um, Sister Onele, for example, and I'm a man, uh, and what I'm being told as a man is different to what Sister Onele has been told. I think as cause I better go 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 ma ma uya king ko lai ko ko kaka sana re wa mutu wa mo laia, and as you sit in a in a in a community or in a group of young women or married women who tell the next woman who's becoming a wife what her duties are, I say duties and I emphasize on duties because I feel like certain duties then conflict with what we're supposed to position ourselves as as abafas, right? And also to the side of the men when they go to the mountains, I don't know personally, but I, I've heard things about the things they tell them and how and, and what they, they, they come back with or what their teachings were. The, the, the things they portray or the things they do when they get to society and community are things that are taught to them. So I always believe we would see certain cultures or certain values and norms and beliefs or traditions are taught to us. And as women, we are taught to suppress ourselves and submit ourselves to men. For example, when um, we are married, Mina, and I'm, I'm a wife and I've got a husband, the moment Kabana and we, we, we argue over something differently, no matter how upset I am, I, I, I must make sure that I submit to my men, no matter how angry or upset or hurt I am, I need to make sure that my body belongs to my husband, irrespective of whether or not I want it to, to happen or not. And I feel like those kind of uh, uh, teachings that are taught by our mothers and our aunts make room for that whole thing about you, you, you don't belong to yourself, you belong to your husband. And that's the same thing that men are talking about. When you get married, your wife belongs to you. She must submit to you. Goes back down to into a patriarchy where we, we teach young men to objectify women. We teach young men who would say they are superior than women. 
to the point where when they, they, they sit next to a, a, a female, they don't see an equal. They see someone who is inferior to the point where when I get married to her, uh, uh, I need to make sure that she knows that I'm the king of the house. We make men kings to the point where when we come through, we, we, we don't come as the king's queen. We come as the queen's servant to the point where we suppress ourselves. And when the man says, I want it now, or I want this now, we, we are taught you need to submit. There's nothing you can do. And I feel, Wuti, even with, with uh, 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 Dinah's parents and Dinah's mother or Dinah's family, when they came to them and they said, Wuye, we want to marry your daughter, it was the law. It was not something new to them. It was what happened when a, a man slept with a woman who was a virgin or a woman who was not married. If a woman was not married at that time, they had to uh, 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 make sure with Bam Shada. If they don't marry that woman, she's, she's uh, defined as dirty. And they don't say, well, you know, if a man sleeps with a woman, then the woman must marry the man. It's always the case of the man decides to marry that woman. So for me, that's, that's the, the, the part where I say certain laws, certain cultures are brought back from the previous generations and they fall down to our generations. We don't question them, we fall because whoever it is that told us that this is how things are done and this is how things are going to continue. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, if we then look at the response when you try to see sim similarities uh, between ancient and modern culture of this thing, when U Shekem, after he has done the deed of raping Udaina, if you look at the passage that we read from, he then approaches his father. He says, if I read it directly from the Bible, Iti, get me this girl as my wife. So he has this command or request that he makes to his father. And earlier, when we were introducing this topic to us, you said culture. And now if I'm going to speak about uh, the rape culture, you said culture is a set of norms and beliefs, set of practices that are now carried from one generation to the next. So in that time, it was, it was very much a practice and culture for, for Shechem, who I see this young girl, to take whatever he needed from the young girl. And then from there on, approach his father, not to beg or plead, but to direct his father to take this girl as his, as his wife. That's the first similarity. And it has not changed if we look at modern society today. In the rural Eastern Cape, East, uh, in the rural KZN, you still have cases that you see on TV of young women who are still in the tender ages of attending school being forcefully taken as wives by 50, 40 year old men and these young girls are 15. The families of those young girls do not now go and protest and say A, B and C, she's still young, I still want her to go study. They now accept the fact that this young girl has been taken as a wife for a 50 year old man. Is that not doing culture? They are very much doing the same thing that was being done by their forebears, their fathers, their, their ancestors. So it's, it's, it, it has not changed in that instance. It, it's only when society sits up and says, this culture that is now you've identified as being harmful to this young, voiceless, innocent girl is no longer a practice that we can tolerate, is no longer a practice that we can sit uh, and be silent when a 15 year old school girl that's something a society we cannot sit and, and look at so there are similar similarities in the story that we've read and in modern times today thank you thank you buddy um i've got a question from facebook from o brother akonama caesar uti what brother Lebu, Lebu Hang Matibo highlighted around cultural dynamics in order to protect men. It is a very noticeable trait that happens in these biblical narratives. How can culture and tradition be chopped and changed so to accommodate Inyala, and I use the word accommodate with intent, which lead me to ask us within our context, which is our church, what usually happens when men commit acts of gender-based violence? Are we able to pinpoint the game plan on our own contest? Thank you. Um, 
Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to say, uh, culture, it's, it's man-made. Mm -hmm. And people can change it. Mm -hmm. If they are benefiting something out of that cultural practice, they can hold on to that. Yeah. But if they don't benefit nothing from that cultural practice, they can easily move on and leave that culture. There are cultural practices. Just to say this, not everything in culture is evil. There are beautiful things in culture, but what's happening, the evil superseded the beauty. Now in culture, we all see now the evil. So it is up to us to say, e culture, for example, look twala, it is evil and brutal. Therefore, we need to let go of such a culture. It doesn't matter who initiated it. It doesn't matter where it was initiated. As long as we discover some evil factors of our culture, we have full rights and full responsibility to do away of those cultural practices and norms. I strongly believe Vukuti, culture, it is not something that is being put where you can't change it because it's our culture. Because they did it in ancient times, it doesn't mean it was right, it's wrong. Because women were perceived as objects and properties of men in ancient times, it doesn't mean it is right, it is wrong. Now we need now to create a culture for our new society, an alternative culture, a culture of love, a culture of valuing the sense of worth of women, a culture of protecting women, a culture of, of embracing each other, a culture of living together as a community without harming each other, without distorting each other, without hating each other. So it is now a time for us as this generation to create an alternative culture, culture that is not harmful to anyone, culture that is not distorting anyone, culture that is not holding anyone from experiencing fullness of life. So culture, there is no board that sits and create and say, these are standards of culture now. It is a society that will decide together that this is an alternative culture. I think these crucial conversations and contextual Bible studies will lead us to create an alternative culture as the church and as a society. So for society's culture to evolve, if we can put it like that, it, 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 it it strongly needs the people that are involved in the society to redefine themselves firstly, and also to re redefine what masculinity is. Because most of our African cultures are defined by, by how we see and how we look at masculinity. If we cannot define what culture is for our own societies and redefine it in a manner that is now going to be favorable towards a feminist outlook, towards a feminist um, uh, point of view towards now, if we're going to sit down as a society to say, um, our culture is being harmful. Our culture is not creating a conducive environment for the young generation that is coming after us. You then need to invite the same people that have been affected or being harmed by the, by the current culture. Because we can't now as the faces of the perpetrators, we can't as the people that are seen as to be perpetuating the, 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 the violent cultures sit and decide on a new path that we need to follow. If you are to redefine culture, you need to invite feminists, you need to invite the young voiceless women who have been violated in, in society. You need to, you need to invite the, the mothers that are silent in the society so that they come and say, in my experience of this culture, this is what was done to me in 1968, but I would not want it to be done to my daughter in 2021. Those are the people that need to come to the table. The church needs to facilitate such conversations. The young people themselves need to facilitate such conversations as to say, we, we, we do not agree with this practices in, the, in our current culture. What, how are we then going to respond to this? We need to be active bystanders. By active bystanders, we need to be people that are going to be vocal about what we want to see in the culture that is coming. Thank you.
Thank you, Puti. Um, we, our next question is, how has been the reaction of Dinah throughout the story and what triggered her reaction? Uh, Jefferson. Yes, this. Just, just to, to say, this question seeks to understand the reaction of Dinah and throughout the story. I think for me, as much as she was silent, and something tells us, Untabi saying mentioned Ugoti, the story is about her, and but she is absent in the story. And what can we learn from that? From the silence of Dinah, when people are becoming victims of rape, um, what do we learn from their silence? Sister Onele, your hand is up. You may answer. One hat. Um, um, I want to believe that Dinah's reaction is influenced by e e society that she grew up in. I, I want to believe that gender-based violence and rape culture was something that was not new to her. I want to believe that it had happened so many times to many other women that she kind of knew how the whole thing was going to play out. So I, I want to believe that she did not react because she didn't have a reaction. She did not react because she knew that her reaction was going to be suppressed one way or another. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Tabi Seng. Your hand is up. Um, I'd like to believe that Ooh, Diana's reaction was actually a, a reaction. Uh, like Sister Anna just said, it was part of what she knew. The, the rape in that society or in that area was not the first of her. That's why the law was already created or oh, that's why the, the next step after he did what he did, he had to go and ask for her hand in marriage. So I believe that Dana's reaction was a reaction to whatever she knew was already going to happen. For example, if you go back to the story of Utama when she was raped by her brother, she also reacted in a way where she knew that I am now dirty, I'm now labeled as dirty, even though I did not do anything dirty to myself. Someone else has already chosen a part for me as the law has already states. So I believe that a, 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 a Dinah's reaction was a reaction that she took, even though it, it seemed silent. It was silent because she knew that the decision was no longer in her hands anymore. She knew that the law back then had already decided that she was, it already painted her as dirty. It already said, if a woman who is not married has sex before marriage, she, she needs to be married by the man who sleeps with her. So she knew that the next steps going forth had nothing to do with what she had to say, which is very, very uh, scary if you think about it in today's time where victims are violated and the moment they speak up, they, they, they can't, be the forefront of the conversation anymore. It's moved back to uh, uh, what to do next with that victim. So I think Dana's reaction was a reaction because of the results of the law back then. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've got a last question from Sister Zamakwai Mboto on Facebook. Uti, do we see a possibility of a gender-based violence-free society on our next generation? Um, 
Thank you so much, um, Chairperson. The question um, seeks to understand also the possibility of having gender-based free society in the future generation. I think it's a most difficult question. At the same time, I don't want to be the prophet of gloom and say we will never have it. But because we are human beings and human weaknesses in us, there will always be casualties. There will be always be situations where these things are happening. But the possibility of flattening the curve, it is possible. The possibility of changing the cultural behavior, it is possible. Unless together we are willing as the society to engage and influence all spheres of society, not to be the responsibility of the church only, but the responsibility of the political sphere, the responsibility of the cultural leaders, the responsibility of the traditional leaders, responsibility of our education system, responsibility of the church and society together and collaborate in engaging in programs that seeks to bring awareness about the implications of this evil practice and behavior. That's number one. Awareness, it is very crucial. Number two, confrontation. Unless we are able to speak and confront and address this evil, all these sectors involve collaborating. The voice coming together in all of us will have an impact. Now, it seems as if now this becomes seasonal. When in some season, for example, come 16 days of activism, then there's so much noise and voice and awareness and confrontation. After 16 days of activism, then the silence, we go back to normal. I think this should, should be a way of life now, this awareness, these campaigns, these conversations, so that we're intentional in ensuring that um, this is it's coming to an end. Maybe my last input on this question is to say, our justice system should be assisting us in this. The, we should be finding, we should be finding measures that fail, that that punishes those who are doing this, punishments that are fair and just for the victim, not fair and just for the perpetrator. It looks like now someone will rape and kill someone and be sentenced 12 years, and then only serve five years, and then seven years you are given a parole, and that is not fair at all. Because a person who's been raped carries an emotional scars forever, an emotional shame forever. Whereas a, a perpetrator, it's 12 years, then it's gone, you are moving on with your life. So our justice system needs now to, 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 to look at the ways. I know the president made a commitment that there will be no bail, na, 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 na. but we see people are getting bail, people are getting parole, people are getting lenient sentences. So therefore, our justice systems, these conversations should not end with us. Also, our justice systems should be core of these conversations, should be part and, and key in these conversations so that at the end, we can have this GBV free society, although we might not be totally free, but we can flatten the, the curve at the scourge of this. Okay, allow me to be an optimist and say to a question your sister Zama, I want to say yes, we can have a GBV free generation if we look at certain things in the society. Number one for me, the one thing that is very close to my heart is that we need to tend and look at the boy child from a very early age. No one is taught violence. Uh, I, I mean, I beg my pardon. I know no one is born violent. They are taught violence. Um, people are not taught how to hate, but um, they see it, they experience the hate. So if we were to go back to society, if we go back to our families, to our churches and to our homes and see the boy child from a perspective of you want to groom in nature this person into an individual who will one, see a woman or a female as an equal person 
two, and who will want to protect this person in any means. So that person will not grow up into someone who's going to perpetrate violence. He's not going to grow up as to someone now, if, if, if my girlfriend cheats on me, the solution is for me to beat her up. The solution is for me to drag her down the street naked so that I humiliate her. No, the solution would be, I tried to love this person and seemingly they could not receive my love. The only thing I can do is to remove from myself from a place of where I am not given the same love back. So if we were to tend to the boy child from an early age, be it from a family, if our parents were to instill a culture of love and nonviolence in boy children, we would go out into society and we would want to protect our girlfriends. We would want to protect our sisters and our aunts and our mothers because it is something that we grew up with. It is something that is rooted deep in our own traits as to say, no, you don't beat up a, a female. The other two things that we would need to look at in trying to get to a society that is gender-based free is to, we would need to listen to survivors, the current survivors now, they have stories that they need to share with us. They have hurt that they need to share with us so that we see not only are they hurt by the perpetrators who do these incidents at those times, but they are also hurt by the responses that they receive from the families, the responses they receive from the church, the responses they receive from, from, from the law authorities where they go and report the stories. But a platform needs to be created for survivors to speak out and address their issues because it is very concerning to say a victim is now silent because they are ashamed of what the family will say. They are now silent, they are ashamed of what the, 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 the friends, what the church and what society will say about what happened to them. And bear in mind that they did not go out and say, please rape me. The other thing that we need to look at, we need to look at uh, educating the generation that is coming. That's the one thing that we need to look at. Yes, we, we, we cannot write off everything that has happened, everything that has been lived, that's part of our history. But going forward, we need to educate the generation that is coming on how to then be better citizens that will now look and carry, who will take care of our female, um, our female counterparts. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kuti. Um, I will now hand over to Umfundi Sukuku to summarize the session before we close. Uh, maybe before Umfundi summarizes, I just have a point. Um, sorry, Slalo, you may have missed my hand. Um, in, in response to a gender-based free society, and you know, if you look at the rapist in this passage that we read, who shake him, <clears throat> I, I would want to believe that even society during those days, um, it's not all marriages that were started through an incident of rape. I I think society then, you know, there, there were still certain good norms of people going into marriage um, from good faith. <clears throat> and, and he was aware of that. He was aware there is a good way of going into a marriage and it did not have to start with rape. And, and I'm sure there were other examples around him of other families that were started um, not through violent means. And so I, I, I want to come back to a point, you know, that says we, even today, we are a society where people often know what is right and what is wrong, but they choose to do wrong anyway. And so if, if our, going back to a point, come from the Sukuku, if, um, you know, society accepts or easily accepts people that do wrong, um, then that becomes the norm. It easily becomes the norm. And, and we've, we've seen it with other um, 
instances of crime where community opens its doors for criminals to come and sell stolen goods uh, to them and community accepts criminality from that early stage and and so it becomes the norm then in society so what we really need um to get to this society that would would have a gender based violence or that will be gender based violence free is to seeing society starting to take control of what happens within that particular society and society not easily accepting the wrong that is perpetuated without you know standing up and coming together to try and stop um uh, the, 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 how can I put it, to, to, to stop just the continuing culture of, you know, it's, it's become acceptable for men to violate women, will protect each other, will cover up for each other, you know. So I think it's really within us as uh, people of society, it's within us in the church as well, you know, for as long as we allow those who are in church leadership not to act when there are instances of abuse of women, um, you know, when when uh, we see that <laughs> ministers are really protecting their colleague here, or Amatotana are really protecting one of them, or uh, the brothers got killed are protecting one of them, and you know we are happy with that. For as long as those things we are comfortable with them, you know, then. Uh, this type of violence will will really become the norm and it will perpetuate so what we need um as i said in my opening points is really to call out each other and so when we know that you know an instance of violence has happened somewhere um ours is to be concerned about the victim ours is to condemn and ours is not to justify and say no but who, who, who a viewer that we know is not an abuser. Maybe uh, he was upset by something, that's why he abused a particular city. Ours is not to do that. And so we, we need to be careful as the society because that is the kind of normality that we will breed, that when we see wrong, we, we make excuses for it. And then it will grow, it will grow into something big, you know? So as I'm saying, I think society has sort of lost its sense of protecting each other. You'll start by accepting, you know, few things that have been stolen, and and then the next thing, you know, it, it will move towards protecting those who violate women, and then you now the list is endless, you know. So society must not easily tolerate uh, that kind of criminality, and society must really stand firm and say this is not what we are going to uh, accept, not in our times. And uh, go um, just to give a brief response and to actually go back to what U Brother Avio was saying, um, going back to a young boy child and a young girl child, I think if we were to change the love language, so to say, because I think society has indoctrinated most of us into thinking that violence is, is, a, is a form of a love language, hence you find girls nowadays that would say um he hit me because he loves me you know um men that's how men show love that's how most men now show love and they've indoctrinated women into thinking that should he hit me then that means he loves me that's his way of reprimanding me or that's his way of of communicating his grievances in the relationship. So I think if we were to go back and especially in the black who never teach us um, a good way of showing love or never teach us the love language that we would love to see and that would actually flatten the curve um, of TPV. Thank you.
Sister Ntabi Seng, your hand was up. Um, so I was just going to go back to Mfunisi and ask Mfunisi about the whole GBV Free Society, especially looking at the context of the church. Um, I think as, as a church, we do have a policy in hand, which is said. However, I feel like a lot of things that we do in paper, on paper do not become practical. I think it also goes back down to what the previous three speakers spoke about uh, in terms of um, protecting the perpetrator instead of looking at the actual um, scenario and the victim at hand. I feel like in society and as a church, we tend to protect and glorify the perpetrator to the point where it becomes a higher deity or uh, 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 a superior. We do not uh, uh, look at them as a perpetrator instead of we, we we take what they did to the woman or to the victim we look at it as a heroism for example um right now if we look at the current stories that we're talking i think the person who's in the limelight right now is makai and Dean, where he is talking about his problems that he's faced as, as as a black man in south africa looking at racism but the moment we spoke about his violations in the the the, the society of raping a young female we brushed it off because he's our hero same thing with our pro former president jacob zuma we brushed it off same thing with Abu or the inboxes or the messages or the texts or the gestures that we get from our uh, male ministers or uh, 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 stewards or brothers in the church, we tend to brush things off and make sure that our perpetrators are protected. So we do have a policy in hand and we, we do know the church is going forth and saying we are protecting you as females, we are protecting you as those who are being harassed. But when it comes to the practicality of it, we find that a lot of times we brush it off because we're trying to protect the perpetrator. And going back to what Uput Abio was saying and what Usis Musa said about uh, uh, teaching the young uh, 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 boy child is that a lot of times the influence that we, we, we instigate or we put onto the young child is really sad because when they see what their older brothers are doing to women, that's the only thing they see, that's the only thing they are taught. If I am in children's ministry and I hear of a story of Umfundisi sleeping around with a lot of females in the, in, in, in the community who are my age and I'm 15 and I consider that as statutory rape, I believe that it is glorified because we, society teaches us that when you are uh, a man and you have multiple partners or you sleep around with a lot of people, you are considered as a kunuba or ganye, a king. So how do we continue to say we are going to live? Uh, I, 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 I'm being positive, right? I, I'm, I'm looking forward to this next chapter of a GBB uh, free society. However, as a church, how do we Say this is going to continue and be free and be clean when we ourselves cannot commit to our own policies, when we ourselves cannot protect the people in our church, when they come to us and they cry and the mothers and the fathers do not comfort, do not welcome us to say, listen, we are going to listen, we are going to work with you through this. Instead, they take the person who's on the highest uh, seat and they protect them. They take the people who are seen as the superior people and they protect them. So how, how do we look forward to... Um, GBV free society, when society continuously makes the perpetrator a hero, when society excludes Utaina and makes Shekem the one who becomes the king because Uber, he's a prince, so they make him the one who decides on behalf of the victim. How do we move forward when already the laws in place that the church has put forward for us do not protect us as women? Thank you. Thank you, Sisi. Um, let me hand over to Usista Snetemba, who is the last person to engage into this question. Sisters in the is off. I think Upum, I think Upum in Sisters in the I can't yes. see her. Okay. In her absence, I will hand over to Umfunde Sukugo to summarize and then we close. Hot. 
one way. Um, thank you so much to the team uh, and Bramfontein Society Wesley Guild for this insightful uh, session that we had. One, the first thing I want to say, I hope this is not just a Usika concentration for the sake of doing Usi, but you are intentional in doing this. You are goal oriented to go to, as this society of Bramfontein Wesley Guild, it will start with us to have a gender-based free society. We will not allow ourselves in our Wesley Guild to, to have guilders who are having character traits of those people who are promoting and advancing patriarchal violence in our society. It will start with us. We will be able to confront each other as this Wesley Guild. We will be able to name and shame each other. We will be able to report each other to relevant structures of the church and also of the society, these things. That's number one. Otherwise, it will be a futile exercise and wasting of our time and data and energy. Now, the time to talk, now. we need now to translate our words into actions now. When you meet now again, maybe in November, as this was the guild, you should be reflecting, Ugoti, I wonder what have we done and achieved from that program that we had on GBV. That's number one. Number two, what I want to say to you as this society, um, we have sexual harassment policy in the Methodist Church, a document, which I'm not sure whether you are familiar with it. If not, I will challenge you to say in your next session, you need to interpret and, and, and invite someone to teach you about that sexual harassment policy. It will guide you on the processes and the steps within the Methodist Church, how to report these cases. And if your case, it because there's a covering up and protecting of a certain individual, there are structures within the Methodist Church of appeal up to the level of arbitrator so it does not end in the society because I'll cover up. If you feel, you feel I don't find fulfillment and righteousness in the way my case has been handled. You, you move to the next level, up to the next level, because our church does not end up a society. So I'm still saying until the papers, the policies of sexual harassment in paper are translated into actions, then we will strive towards becoming this GBV free society. And it needs us to take an initiative in reading and familiarizing ourselves with those policies and structures. I mean, you can even talk or not only invite someone to talk about policy of Methodist Church sexual harassment, someone to come and teach you about chapter 11 of discipline in the Methodist Church, how to lay a complaint in the charge in the Methodist Church. And that person will take you through to teach you the protocols, the processes, and the structures even include of appeal and all of that. So we need to be intentional. Lastly, I want to say in the society, those who are keeping quiet, those who are covering up, those who are ignorant of the scourge of gender-based violence are equally guilty. So we need now, when we leave this session, to rekindle and reawaken our conscience as individuals and ask ourselves a question, what am I going to do when I see it, when I experiencing it, it happening? What am I going to do? May God of love and God of peace help you and be assured Uguti, we, it is possible, it is possible, but it begins with an individual and it needs courageous people it needs responsible people. It needs people who are willing to take a risk and be courageous. Um, with those words, I just want to say thank you for inviting me and thank you to the team of the Gilders from the Synod in respective circuits that 
came to assist me and share with me this session. Thank you so much. I know we took your time even during preparation. Thank you so much. To the superintendent and the president, thank you. Thank you. May God bless you. Thank you very much, uh, Petula, and thank you to the chairperson of the Wesley Gilder Bram uh, for the session that we have. I want to say to you, Chair, I, I, I am I'm more like I need the program of action now. What are you going to do about the information? So I am giving you guys until what's the date today? It's the 19th. By the end of the month, please, I need a program of action. What you will do about what we just had now. And, and I don't want us to have a talk show. We've been here for two hours. We can't afford that and waste data and energy and appear on screens. But let us work. And we, we, have, we have issues that are affecting young people where we are and we need to begin to take responsibility and take action about those things. So I want that program by the end of the month um, so that we, we really take this very, very serious. I want to thank you all uh, to our fellow guilders around the Synod, much appreciated at the work that you are doing. And we have come to the end of the program. I want also to thank the viewers at home for being with us and supporting the work that the youth is doing to combat the scourge of the gender-based violence. I do want to invite you at 6 p.m. on the Central Synod page. We will be launching the district uh, campaign uh, for 2020, 2021 and going forward. Remember I've said before that we must not be people who are reactionary when something happens, but we must continuously be alert and be on guard and fight it. And it's possible, it's, do it, it's doable. We can end this and it begins by me and you. May God bless you. And we will ask uh, brother Aviva Uvaisi to pray as we close. Thank you, uh, Mungamedi. Um, am I audible? Yes. Uh, thank you. Let, let, let us pray. Baba Ingwele is when God said to him, Jesus Christ, that we do not suffer. Sibel bukuluba kuchiko. Sibel kuzana na wezo manda. Ebu cheni betu. Sibel wezo manda manda ako. Chiko na manda. Buspa chiko na manda. We talk about these issues that we are facing each and every day. Father Lord, we have done everything, Lord. We have campaigned, we have stand, stood in solidarity. But Lord, it seems like each and every day when we issue these statements, when we when when we have these campaigns, it seems like to Manda the numbers are increasing each and every day. They are not just numbers, Lord, it is the Abandona Baban, Tobandana Bo, the means of Baban to Somanda who have been killed so brutally. And there, Lord, as we continue with these programs, Lord, we ask for your presence, Samantha. We ask, Lord, that and we are looking forward to a gender-based violence-free country, gender-based violence-free world, Somanda. It starts with me, it starts with us, and therefore, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity, we thank you for this session, we thank you for your servant, Mfundi Sukoko, we thank you, Lord, for the executive of the for installing such great idea to them and everyone who participated in this thing, Lord. And we thank you, Lord. Uh, may you be with us all and guide us and continue to install with wisdom to all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. And, and thank you very much to everybody and to the viewers. And this is our goodbye. Bye-bye. Papa, 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 papa